everyone. I'm Kushbu Jha, founder of Buy Properly. We are a fintech startup that allows people to buy fractions of a house through a platform online. And the starting minimum is a low of 2,500. As part of our company's efforts, we organize education events to help people make informed choices and learn about the value of diversification when investing. Uh, wherein we also fit in in a small way because uh, real estate should be a part of a diversified uh, asset portfolio. Being from Amazon and having spent five and a half years here, it's an honor and privilege and quite exciting actually to um, come back here and do a, a webinar for uh, my Amazon friends. So thank you to Perry and Aki for um, allowing me to uh, we would have uh, two professors, Dr. Chinmay Jain and Dr. Archana Jain, um, who would be talking about um, one, personal finance and how does uh, asset portfolio management work? And the second piece is on the risk return um, aspect of it in the context of diversification, because everybody has a different uh, risk appetite. Uh, there are enough people who just sit on holds of cash like me and don't invest anywhere much. And there are people like Dr. Jen um, who have a lot of rich investing experience. So with that, uh, I, would like you to uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Chinmay Jain. He's an assistant professor uh, in the Faculty of Business and Information Tech uh, at Ontario Tech University. His research primarily focuses on market microstructure, short selling, high frequency trading, financial regulations, and cryptocurrency. He teaches courses on finance, derivatives, electronic trading and exchanges, and of course, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. He's also a passionate real estate investor. And with that, I would um, give Professor Jain to talk about personal finance. Thank you, Kushu. Um, and thank you everyone for being here for this session. So today I'll talk about uh, personal finance and uh, what kind of strategies you can have right now. We are all going through a tough time. Um, uh, the markets have gone down. Not only that, uh, this pandemic is causing everybody to stay at home. So it is a good time for you to reflect on your portfolio and uh, see if you need to come up with some new strategies. So this is what S&P 500 looks like in the recent times. So S&P 500 is the major index uh, in the US markets. And we saw that it was at the peak in February and it went down uh, in March quite a bit, almost 30%. So what can we learn from this market crash as far as your own investing and portfolio is considered? So one thing we can learn is you cannot predict these recessions uh, and, and bubbles that we see in the market. So, uh, uh, so they are not predictable. So what you need to do is you need to keep a long-term view for investing. You don't want to invest for short term because if you invest and a recession comes right after investing, you can lose a lot of money. So what I want you to do is see it as a buying opportunity. So I think most of you buy your clothes, your shoes uh, during Christmas time you all know that there's a big sale during that time and that's when you plan to do your shopping. So with stock markets, there is no fixed time during the year when there's a sale, but sometimes these sales come when nothing fundamentally changes with the companies, but suddenly their prices drop. So there's no doubt that the earnings will be lower for companies for the next couple of quarter, but fundamentally the good companies are not going to change and it is a good opportunity to buy stocks. And do not panic if you see a decline in your portfolio. So if you have a retirement account or if you have invested money with a brokerage account, I'm sure your portfolio has gone down by about 20%. And uh, do not panic to see that. So eventually the market is going to recover. So if you look at the long-term chart, so first we looked at the short-term chart for six months. If you look at the long-term chart, and if you try to make a, just a trend line, you can see it's pretty like upward trend. And, and compared to this upward trend, this downfall is pretty small. So if you invested from 2008 uh, at the level of 1000 of S&P 500, you're still up about 150%. So if you're a long-term investor, 
uh, it doesn't affect your portfolio as much versus being in the market for speculation. So th these recessions do not last for a long time. I think the longest recession was 1929. And the other recessions like 87 and 2007, they have lasted for even shorter times, two years and one and a half years. So markets eventually recover from all recessions. So that's uh, a relief we can take by looking at the historical data. So who loses money in these market crashes? So again, like I said, if you're in the market for long term, you're okay. But if you're a panic seller, so let's say some of you saw that some of your stocks went down by 30, 40% and you start selling them, then you lose money in the market. But if you're waiting for the market to recover, you're going to be okay. And also there are some short-term traders who trade on margin. So let's say you had $1,000 and you bought stocks worth 2,000 by borrowing money from your brokerage and the stock goes down by 50, 60%, you get a margin call from your brokerage company. And if you don't put down the margin, then they sell your stock. So you don't want to be a short-term trader trading on margins. Third, you don't want to be a speculator. So you should not be buying penny stocks. If you were holding some small companies before this crash, there's a good chance they might go bankrupt. So you might lose all of that money. And fourthly, one important thing I want to point out is behavioral biases. So a lot of people lose money because they, they let emotions come into the picture of their decision making. I'll elaborate on that a little bit. So if you go to this, uh, so in this next slide, I'll talk about the mistakes that uh, some of the investors make. So for example, if you're trying to fish for bottom, then you may not be able to do that. You might keep waiting. So for example, the markets were down uh, 30% two weeks ago and you were still waiting for the bottom, you did not do any buying, you lost on this 10% gain the markets have had in the last two weeks. Now, of course, there's a possibility the markets will go down again, but you never know for sure. So for example, if this is how the markets were behaving, and if you bought anywhere around this area where the markets were down, you were good. But if you kept waiting for these bottoms and you did not buy at that time, you might uh, not be able to buy stocks uh, at all because you might just keep waiting. So there might be some other behavioral biases, for example, confirmation bias. So what people do is they try to look for news that will confirm their opinion. So if you think the markets are going to go down further, you will focus on news uh, on Yahoo Finance or Wall Street journals where analysts are saying that markets are going to go down further. Hindsight bias. So Hindsight is 2020, so you will see that half of the people are saying right now that the markets will go down further 10%, and half of the people are saying that they are going to recover from here. So which means half of them, they are going to be correct, correct for sure. And there are also some people who are saying both things. They are saying that, oh, I think markets will recover, but there's a chance it will go down another five or 10%. So for sure, they are going to be right, right? So, so this is called as hindsight bias. And also then you might have illusion of control bias. You might think that I'm, a, I'm good at picking stocks. So think about it. Warren Buffett, he bought Delta Airlines in, in February for $46. And now it is trading at $21. So even Warren Buffett was not great at picking that stock. He made the wrong choice. So, so instead try to pick a broader market index instead of picking stocks. Do not go by herd mentality. Like do not do what everybody is doing. If you see everybody selling, don't just sell because your friends are selling. And recency bias. So what people do is they try to focus on what has happened more recently. So all of you are feeling a little hurt. Your portfolio has gone down by 20%. The sentiment is negative. And even when the market starts recovering, you may be reluctant to invest. So that is a recency bias. You're focusing on the hurt that you had in the recent past. So don't be biased by these uh, biases and, and don't try to pick, pick stocks. And also some people have aversion for, pick, for booking a loss. So it has been shown that the stocks that have done well in the past continue to do well, and the stocks that have done poorly, they continue to do poorly. So it's a good idea to sell the stocks that are not doing well in your portfolio and focus on the stocks that are doing well. 
And finally, we have heard of the news that there were a lot of workers who got laid off and they do not have money for even their daily needs. So it's always a good idea to have some liquidity in your savings. So have some saving that you can uh, uh, use whenever you need instead of having it put in a retirement account which you cannot withdraw. So having liquidity always helps. So this is one picture that I found circulating on internet and it shows a lot of mistakes what that people make. So like when the, so here, this was, let's say February and people, let's say didn't buy here. They were waiting. That was a good thing, but let's say market went down 10% and I'm one of the person who bought here. So when the market went down percent, I bought. And uh, so there are other people who do this when they see market falling down, they buy it. But, but if you see it's falling further, doesn't mean you start selling because what people do is they buy here and then they sell here and then they again buy when it goes up. So that's a mistake you should avoid. So if you have bought at a price which is higher than the current price, just hold on to it. You don't need to sell thinking it will fall further. Nobody can predict how much lower the markets are going to go. So these are some emotional biases, again, that I was talking about. People make mistakes uh, based on their biases. So what can you do? So you can continue investing like every month or every week. And not so people talk about SIP, systematic investment plan, so which means you invest the same amount every month. I think you should actually invest more. You should invest more right now if you have some cash sitting with you. And try not to pick stocks, focus on S&P 500 or any broad market index. And also it is a great time to reevaluate your portfolio weights. So it is possible that a lot of you have only invested in, in stocks. You have not even thought about other alternative assets. So let's say if you just started working five years ago, 10 years ago, you have saved some money and you opened a brokerage account, you bought some stocks. And you might not have much idea about how much bond should I have? How much of alternative assets should I have? So there's a great time to think about all of that. So why diversify portfolio? So I think uh, uh, Archna will talk about that also in the next uh, session a bit more in the next presentation. But you want to diversify a portfolio to reduce the impact of volatility on your portfolio. So when stocks go down, the bonds don't go down as much. So you want the value of your overall portfolio to remain not so fluctuating. So to reduce the impact you want of volatility on your portfolio, you want to diversify your portfolio. And when you diversify, you get rid of systematic risk. So you get a higher return for the same level of risk. Even within diversification, you can have different types of portfolio. If you want a higher return, you can have aggressive portfolio. If you want a lower return or lower risk, uh, you can have a conservative portfolio. So this is what bond markets look like. So if you look at this chart, you can see there was a big drop in the stock market in 2000, another big drop in 2008. But if you look at the bond market, the returns have been pretty constant. So it, it is good to have some bonds in your portfolio, which reduces the impact of this volatility on stock market on your portfolio. And also how much of bonds you want to have, how much of stocks you want to have is another question. So this is one screenshot I took from my uh, retirement account. So the, your retirement account gives you some options. One is uh, your Canadian stocks that you want to buy and the international stocks that you want to buy. And within Canadian, you might have an option of buying small stocks, which give you a higher return. And when you're close to retirement, you want to have some cash in your retirement account because you're doing some withdrawing every year. So you want to have some of that when you're close to retirement. If you're not, you don't have to worry about that. And if you don't want to be an active investor, so if you're more active, you will choose the percentage yourself. But if you are more of a passive investor, you can choose a target date fund. So let's say you're retiring in 2035. So you can choose the 2035 target date fund. So how will you choose, if you're an active investor, how do you choose how much bonds and how much stocks you should buy? So you want to assess your risk appetite. So basically you can take some survey on internet based on what is your age, what are your goals, when are you going to retire? Uh, based on all those factors, you can see how much risk you should be taking. Uh, you can 
then choose a balance of growth versus value stocks. So value stocks historically give a larger return. Small stocks give you a larger return. And especially if you're a Canadian, then you want to invest in international stocks as well because Canadian market does not give you exposure to many sectors. So you want to look at your age. You want to look at your other income sources. So if you have other income sources apart from your retirement account, you want to include that in your analysis. And you want to do a goal-based investing. So you want to see if you have kids who are going to college. If you want to buy a second vacation home, when do you want to buy it? And you also want to think about how much should you save every year so that you will have enough near your retirement. And you, there are, if you take a finance 101 class, you can do that, finding the present value and future value of cash flow. But I just Googled a, a retirement calculator on internet from Vanguard. So you can put down your age, you can look at when are you retiring, what do you make right now, how much are you saving right now, and how much um, you, you have saved already, and how much would you need in your retirement. And you can play with these numbers. So basically the retirement calculators, they allow you to play with these numbers. So if you want 80% of your income during retirement, you'll have to save more annually. So what you need to do is figure out how much you're investing every year, if that is enough for your retirement. So again, what are the factors? Your age, your major expenditure, your house, the kids that are going to college, uh, the retirement money that you need. And you can also take surveys to figure out how much risk you like to take. For example, this is one question I found on the internet that if you reach a game, where you are allowed to have $10,000 right away, or you have a 5% chance of winning 100,000. So maybe some of you are fall into this category of D. But if you are, then you have to be even more careful because you like taking risk, but you don't want to risk the money that you are saving for your retirement, right? You don't want to have the risk that you retire and suddenly there's no money in your retirement. account. So you want to be careful. So sometimes what I do is I hold my wife accountable for my investments. So I always, she always looks at my investments and makes sure I'm not taking too much. So that helps me sometimes. So again, when you're doing active versus passive investing, so if you buy a mutual fund, they do more active investing. They try to pick stocks that they think can do better than the market. But if you buy index fund, for example, SPY is an in, in, is index fund, SPYDER, S-P-Y is the ticker symbol. So they try to track a market index. So the research has told us that if you try to do active investing, uh, then you don't make much in most of the cases. By doing a passive investing, actually you can increase your return because you are not trading as much. So uh, this is a published paper uh, in Journal of Finance that talks about uh, uh, cost of active investing. And also you want to see if you want to use a target fund or you want to do manual rebalancing of your retirement portfolio. So this is an example of a target date fund. Uh, so basically you can see if you're retiring in 2050, uh, there's, there's not a much money into the fixed income. Most of the money is in the Canadian stocks. So again, I want to emphasize on uh, target date funds. If you are not an active investor, they are a good choice for you and most of the plans offer that. Um, so they have some advantages that it is on autopilot, they are simple, but the disadvantages, they assume that everybody that is who's retiring at, in that particular year has the same goals and needs. So other alternative investments, some of them are available to you and some are not. For example, private equity and hedge funds are not available to a regular investor. Uh, but you can invest in real estate, commodities, uh, gold and silver. This is a chart for gold. It has been very volatile, but some people see it as a safe haven. Uh, so you can consider it, but it is very volatile. And uh, finally, I want to show you that uh, compared to stocks, real estate has done uh, pretty well. So the, the returns from real estate are not that low. And also the volatility is not that high as well. So research has shown that if you include alternative assets apart from bonds and stocks, you can increase your return for the same level of risk. So this is efficient frontier, which means the return that you can make for a particular risk level. And you can shift the efficient frontier by including alternative assets in your portfolio. 
So, and, and one of the successful investor, uh, the endowment officer of Yale, he also invests 20% in real estate. So you can use leverage in real estate, so you can borrow money, so you can borrow up to 80%. And how do you invest in real estate? So you can do direct investment, which is expensive, but there are other ways of investing in uh, real estate. You can use ETFs, but e uh, you can use REITs, but they mostly invest in commercial real estate, so if you want to invest in residential, uh, then the options are few. And one of them is buy properly that uh, Kushbu is working on. So you can use that. And here, the last thing I want to show is the return from real estate. They are also quite stable, just like what you saw from the bond market. You have a small bump here, but most of, but apart from that, it has been pretty, uh, pretty consistent. So, but to conclude, invest for long-term, have a well-balanced portfolio based on your risk appetite, buy indexes, don't focus as much on individual stocks, consider assets other than stocks and bonds, and have an emergency fund for, uh, for a situation like this when people end up losing their jobs. Uh, yeah, that's what I want to say in conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jain. We can take questions at this time, if anybody has any questions. Uh, I guess you can either raise your hand or click on the q and if you have questions. If not, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Jen. That was really nice of you. Um, you. Next, we have um, Dr. Archana Jain. She is joining us from New York. She is an assistant professor at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, she her focuses on market microstructure, short selling, and corporate governance. She teaches corporate financial management, financial markets, and investment. Um, and she has an experience in working in accounting as well as a senior, as well as as a senior consultant. 500 company. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaren, for joining us. Actually, we have a question um, for Dr. Jaren. I think he dropped off. We can ask him in the or if you would like to take that question, um, Dr. Jaren. So the question is for people investing. For people in passive investing, how can we use the opportunity to buy now? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, you can see it in the uh, Q&A. For oh. people in passive investing, how can we use the, oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, there's a question for you, uh, Dr. Chidmayev. For people in passive investing, how can we use the opportunity to buy now? Um, so, yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, so if you're into passive investing, I think you can buy ETFs like Spider, SPY. So I'm sure there are some ETFs in the Canadian markets as well. Uh, but Spider is a good ETF to uh, invest in a broad market uh, index. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, Dr. Archana. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thank you for this opportunity to talk about risk return and diversification. So uh, some of the things that Chinmay mentioned, I'm going to kind of reinforce that and I'll talk about what exactly we mean when we say return and risk uh, and what is a good diversified portfolio should look like. And I will also show you the historical return of different asset classes and what lessons we can learn from the history. Okay, so to start with, what is return and risk? So when we're talking about return, we include both sides of the return. So if you have stock, that means we're talking about dividend that you receive from the company directly. And also if there is capital gain or loss on the sale of the stock. Same thing for bonds, the interest that you receive from the borrower directly and the capital gain and if you're talking about real estate then rent and the capital gain if you have okay so those are the return and in terms of risk that 
we kept saying that how much risk you want to take, uh, is it too risky or not? What do we mean by that? Uh, that is basically the volatility or standard deviation or fluctuation in the prices that you see. So it goes up, it's good. That's what you want. That's your return. It goes down, that's the risk or the um, problem that you're facing and you, you don't want that. Okay. Uh, so that's return and risk. And this is the chart that is showing you the historical return of uh, four different asset classes. Uh, so let me explain what this is uh, first and then uh, we'll talk about more in detail. So first is saying, if you look at this uh, orange line, uh, hopefully everybody can follow here. Uh, if you had one dollar to buy something in 1925, to be able to buy the same thing in 19 uh, in 2017, uh, you would need 13 dollars for that. Okay, so that's your inflation. And if you had invested money in the treasury bills, and again, um, I am more uh, accustomed to the U.S. market. So when I say treasury bills, I'm talking about the bonds, short-term bond issued by the U.S. federal government. Um, so if you had invested your money, $1 in the U.S. Uh, federal government bond, the short-term ones, that will become $20. So these are considered risk-free. The U.S. government has never defaulted in the history. And also because they are short-term, there is not much risk of a price fluctuation. So as you can see, there's a smooth upward trend in the return of the treasury bills, but it's very small. Then we add the long-term government bond. They are still free of default risk, but now we are adding the price fluctuation risk. So if it's a long-term bond, 10-year, 20-year bond, then who knows what happens in the market. And if the interest rate changes, then price of the bond will change. And that is showing you again, there is a little fluctuation, but overall still there is an upward trend. Okay. Then we add large company stocks. So these are uh, uh, biggest 25% companies on the New York Stock Exchange. And these are basically actively followed by analysts, bigger market capitalization. Amazon would definitely be a part of it. Uh, so those are the large cap stocks. If you had invested money in that, $1 will become 7,000. And then we have small company stocks, which is uh, bottom 25% of the firms listed in the New York Stock Exchange. And again, that $1 will become $36,000. So this is just showing you how the different asset classes have performed over last 91 years in the US market. Uh, and the lesson here is, as you can see, there is a fluctuation. So small company stocks gave you the highest return. Your money would be most valuable. If you had 91 years to wait, yes, you would maybe put all your money in the small company stocks, but that's not the case. Our investment horizon is usually five years, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, so if you invested at, let's say, around the 1927 mark before the recession in 1930, that's where you have lost most of the money. The fluctuation is highest in the small company stock. Okay? So what is this historical data telling us? First. There's nothing to worry about, not to panic, that we recovered from all historical recessions for each asset class. Everything recovered, everything started going back up with all the recessions. There were about seven uh, during the figure that I showed you. So no need to panic. Uh, and long-term investing is better than running after market timing. So um, if you were to do, let's say, I'm going to buy today, sell tomorrow, or sell in a week or in a month, those type of trading, short-term trading, is better suited for uh, institutional investors who are trading in billions and trillions of dollars. And if they make a penny return on their investment, that is still a lot, right? Because uh, in terms of percentage, even a 0.01% return is a lot on a, a billion and trillion dollar. But for uh, retail investors like me or you most likely, it's better to think of long-term investing and passive investing that's safer. So you invest money and then forget about it for some time and let it grow, okay? Um, so other lesson, high reward will come with high risk. So as Chinmay mentioned, you have to see what is your risk appetite, okay? Not everybody is interested in the same risk level. Maybe you want the highest risky investment for the highest return because I just started working and I have lots of years left before the retirement. If I lose some money, I'll be okay with that. So that's you are a high risk appetite person, you can take that, but not someone who's close to the retirement, okay? Uh, so you need to keep that in mind. Um, then we are talking about risk. The risk can be of two types. The one that we cannot avoid, and that is 
systematic risk. No matter how many different asset classes you buy, they're all going to go down, okay? So that is systematic risk, which affects a large number of firms, also known as market risk, non-diversifiable risk. And here are some examples. If you're talking about changes in GDP of a country, uh, that will affect everything in the country. Uh, 2008 global financial crisis, the subprime mortgage crisis, it impacted everything worldwide, no matter what you had. And of course, the most recent one, the pandemic coronavirus, uh, it's impacting everything, no matter what you buy, it's going to be impacted by that, okay? Of course, uh, not everything is going to be impacted in exactly the same way. Um, some will get more hit by it and some will get less hit. And there might be some outliers who are actually doing well in this market, okay? Uh, so this is just showing you some of the worst performers. Um, so my black chart here is the S&P 500 index. So you can consider that as the average market performance. And then I have Delta here, which you can see has suffered a lot in last one month. And the other line is Southwest Airlines. So both of them have performed very badly. So if for any reason all your money was invested in the airline industry, that would have been a bad choice and you would have lost a lot of money okay uh, of course there are some outperformers too amazon you all are familiar with that it's performing above the market right now and also zoom technology we are all using zoom um, the number of downloads have gone significantly higher so the price of zoom is also um, going up and it's doing well okay and this is a company which filed for bankruptcy or about to file for bankruptcy before all of this started, right? So as you can see how some of them are doing very well in this technology, uh, in this situation, okay? Um, so again, we don't want to be in the situation where we only have the airline industry stock, as you can see here. Uh, another reason why not to do that is there are some firm specific risks too, which you could actually diversify if you had uh, split your money in different asset classes. Uh, this is the risk that would affect limited number of firms, okay? Uh, for example, uh, strike by the employees of Sears, uh, oil spill at British Petroleum, and parts shortage at General Motors. So these are all historical events, uh, which shows that if you had investment in only Sears or only BP or only GM, you would have lost a lot of money in that case. Okay? So systematic risk will impact every asset class. Uh, but some will be impacted more or less by it and unsystematic risk will impact a particular firm or industry or a geographical region and so that is another reason why you want to have a well diversified portfolio okay so the key lesson here is do not put all your eggs in one basket okay so that's the key that you want something else to compensate your losses uh, when the times are not good so if I showed you this and said that I have stock of Dell and um, Oracle, Google, Intel, all the technology sector company, would you consider this as a diversified portfolio? The answer should be no. This is exactly similar to saying, I have Delta, I have Southwest, I have American Airlines, and I'm a diversified investor because I have 20 different airline industries in my uh, companies in my portfolio. Or here we are saying 20 different technology sector companies in my portfolio. That is not a good diversification. You're still primarily invested in one industry, one sector, which if something goes wrong, for example, right now, the airline industry, you would have had a lot of loss, okay? Um, so the rules of diversification that we want to invest in several different asset classes or sectors, not just one, and that can reduce our risk because if something is not doing well in our portfolio, hopefully something else is doing well and that will offset our losses. Okay, so it reduces the risk and that would be a better investment choice. Um, what does a good, well diversified portfolio look like? According to Schwab, you should have everything in your portfolio large company stocks, small company stocks, international stocks. Uh, commodities, real estate, and all that, okay? Um, so that is um, a good, well-diversified portfolio would look like, but who has the money to buy every single thing? So not to worry, we have the alternative for that. We can invest via mutual funds or exchange-traded funds, okay? So if you want an exposure to, let's say, large company stock, so instead of buying 50 different companies, you can buy an exchange-traded fund, which will mimic the return 
of large company stock. And I'm sure everybody is familiar, but if not, very quickly, these are pool of money. So a lot of investors are giving money to mutual funds and ETFs, and then they buy different asset classes or lots of different companies' stocks, and you get a fraction of everything. Okay, so it's a fractional investment. Uh, you get exposure to a lot of different asset classes uh, while with the mutual fund and ETF. Mutual funds are more actively managed in general, and ETFs or exchange traded funds are more passive management, and they usually mimic the return of some kind of index fund. So lower fees, of course, uh, for ETF than mutual fund, and also um, ETFs is traded um, at every time. You know what's the fair price, and it's traded at the fair price. Uh, whereas mutual fund priced at the end of the day, okay, depending on the demand and supply and so on. Okay? So as I said, mutual funds, ETF, those are the routes to go to the stock market and bond market and commodities or anything. And um, I must say buy properties has a similar model which allows you fractional investment in the real estate uh, if you want to buy some real estate and you don't want to just buy the whole house, you do fractional investing using buy property. Um, so that's all. And in general terms, the strategy, what you should do, no need to change your existing portfolio if it is well diversified. If you think that you have already invested in different asset classes, don't need to panic, specifically if your retirement is far away. It will come back up, as we have seen from all the seven recessions we recovered and the market went back up. So that's not to worry about. And if it is not well diversified, then maybe you need to think about rebalancing. Specifically, this is the time that's reminding us that we don't want to be invested in one single industry or firm. Um, so again, you might think that why should I sell if I have losses? At least you'll have tax benefits. So when you sell, you have capital loss that can offset your other income and you can save some taxes on that. And um, um, specifically, if you're high income tax uh, bracket, uh, then you can save some taxes and it can even carry over. So if you don't use all the losses this year, you can carry them forward for about 20 years, I think. Okay, so um, anyways, you can keep using those losses to offset the future income as well. Okay, so that's another reason you might want to still consider uh, diversifying if it is not a well diversified portfolio. Uh, if you're sitting on cash, then this is the time to start investing now. You don't have to worry if this is all the way bottom, if the market will keep falling. Uh, so the strategy would be not go all in, but invest uh, some fraction of money, maybe every week or every month. Uh, at this time, I think week is a better option. So you will average out your cost. So even if the market goes down tomorrow more, you will have some investment today, some next week and some the week after that your cost will average out. And even whether the market is going up or down, you still are buying at a low point. Right now, the market is at a low point. If it's not all the way low, it's low point and will come back up, okay? Um, so other strategies regarding the um, restricted stock units, RSUs, uh, you might be wondering what to do with that. So if you have otherwise diversified portfolio, okay? Uh, then again, don't worry about it. Hold the RSUs and because the company has good growth potential and it's gonna do well. And it is doing well right now in this market. Uh, but if you don't have a diversified portfolio, all you have is you are an employee of Amazon and you have RSU of Amazon, nothing else. That is a bad strategy. That is again, like putting all your eggs in one basket. So in that case, maybe you want to consider some of them and buy uh, something else and have a well diversified portfolio, okay? Um, so that's all I have. And then if you have any questions, uh, I'm open for those. Thank you, Dr. Arjuna. Um, open the floor to questions. I believe we did have one question. Uh, let's see. I don't see in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, I think, I think Dr. Chin may answer. Too. Yeah. So for the viewers, I don't know if you can see the question. The question was, since the interest rate is low, what is the ratio of the bank that is recommended for holding property? I'm assuming we should keep cash or stocks in the rate low and we may cash out some money and keep it as stock or cash as now. So, you're the doc, yeah. Can you read the question in the Q&A section? Yeah. And I think Dr. Chinmay answered. 
It's about buying real estate or oh, okay, I see now. So there's you should buy what you can at a discount. If a real estate property can be bought at a lower price because of the pandemic, it's a good idea. Also, it is good for diversifying. With low interest rates, you can get a mortgage with lower rates. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Chinmajan because um, you need to have a diversified portfolio and that does not change whether it is current scenario or later. It's maybe an opportunity for you to re-look at things and yes, whatever you were missing out earlier, now is the time to add it. But at all times, you need to have a diversified portfolio. And that's the idea of why you need to balance or rebalance your portfolio to make sure you covered on all sides. Any other questions? Guess not. Go uh, There is one. In the, uh... How aware should we be about financial contagion due to high levels of corporate and retail debt? Will this impact stock prices in the coming months? Good one, if you would like to take that. So, so companies that are not able to repay debt, I mean, they will go bankrupt. So, and I think uh, government is helping companies uh, by giving stimulus and giving them money. So, for example, AI industries, they are like uh, using billions of cash every day. They are spending so much cash every day without any cash flow. So I think government is having to uh, bail them out or help them. Uh, so definitely it helps to have stocks of bigger companies. Like if you buy Google or, uh, or Amazon or companies that have earnings and that are not affected as much, the companies that have cash to repay the debt. But the companies that were already in trouble before this crash, they are uh, getting Going more in this uh, crash. So, of course, the the uh, any problem to debt affects the stock price as well. So you want to stay away from companies that are having difficulty repaying their debt. Okay, so I can add on to that. That um, that is why uh, you want again diversification helps because some industries have heavy debt and some industries have less. So utilities and airline industries would have a um, large portion of their financing through debt versus if you look at the technology sector there is very little debt in those firms so if you have a mix of everything then again if you have losses from those industries which are heavy debt um, oriented uh, will be offset by those which are not heavily relying on debt there's one okay i think we have Something else. A person who was investing for retirement and is dependent so on that. There's a question about retirement. A person who was investing for retirement is dependent on that investment now. Uh, so I think a person who's already retired, I think that person already has his investment in a safer portfolio. But let's say if your retirement is 10 or 20 years away, you don't have at least 10 or 20 years away, you don't have to worry about it. So I think uh, if you are already retired, I'm hoping that your uh, retirement account is invested in bonds more and, and cash equivalent uh, savings more rather than stocks. And uh, if you are away from retirement, I don't think you need to worry about this crash in the stock prices. So yeah, this this should be short lived. Um, if if it is even your you are in the retirement phase and you're relying totally on the investment income, um, it it should it should pass and you should be fine. And like I, I mostly have fixed income, so interest rates are uh, looking good at least in the U.S. market. If you look at the bond yields over long term, they are starting to go. Up. So it should not be a very long recession period. Um, maybe another year, and hopefully by that time uh, it will all come back to normal scenario. Um, so I think it should be okay. Uh, just just a little bit uh, rough pace for those who are using the retirement money right now. Um, but just keep it as it is. You already have the safe investment. 
most retirement um, companies usually have um, move you towards the bond market as you go close to the retirement. So you should have more fixed as Jinnah mentioned. Uh, so there's a question about how do you invest in commodities? So I guess if you want to buy oil, you don't want to put a barrel of oil in your garage. Uh, you can buy ETFs again. So there are ETFs that expose you to commodities. So if you want to buy gold, you can buy a gold ETF. If you want to buy oil, you can buy oil ETF. So, and they are traded on stock markets, just like other stocks. And they are very much correlated to the price of oil or gold or the commodities that you are willing or you're interested in buying. So although you're buying a stock, but it is linked to the price of a commodity, and it makes it easier for you to buy those commodities. Uh, there's a national, another question about uh, will the stimulus lead to resurgent in the stock price? So um, this should help definitely the stock market. Um, however, this is a temporary solution. If the virus is not contained, then it will not be able to sustain this um, the growth in the uh, this won't be stimulus won't be enough so unless we hear something from the medical front uh, this should be temporary and if if we hear improvement on the medical side then definitely this stimulus is going to help the market and the prices might stay up for that i think more than helping um, the companies in the long run it's making sure that the companies do not fire and then go employees and ton of time recovering from that hiring because that will prolong the process so it's kind of taking from the 2008 playbook where um the sooner you work it the lesser that be um at least in the market the focus is more on how to ensure these don't fire employees which then shortens the time to recovery because as the a virus is contained then you can just go back to being normal or what it was if however that's not there then you've let employees go and then you have to rebuild and rehire and and then you lose a lot of valuable time and just resetting up the thing so i guess that's that's the key that the stimulus the way it's structured at least in canada does Uh, what does what does life look like in a post coronavirus world and when that might happen <laughs> that's a million dollar question if you knew exactly when uh, that would be you know uh, a lot of value money uh, in that uh, i don't know when well, personally but um uh, per, so i teach at rit and there is some discussion happening uh, of teaching fall courses online, so which gives you some idea that it's not coming to an end soon. Uh, and even if we do, I read one of the Dr. Fashi's, uh, who's the advisor for the United States president, uh, he said, uh, if we open the markets now, then there would be another wave in fall. So uh, if we keep it closed until the a vaccine is developed then it might end soon but otherwise it will keep on coming phases like that so again no no particular answer but like i said we are discussing if fall semester will be taught online so that gives you some idea of uh, uh, what does it look like the companies who are strong will survive uh, so again resources allocation will happen more efficiently i think so those companies who are weak will be out of the market and uh, of course there'll be some personal level there'll be a lot of uh, losses too so that's um, but i mean in terms of market um, good companies will survive and that's where you want to put your resources in anyways and the bad companies will probably be out of the market in that way. i think we did a whole webinar on uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, impact and for those of you who might be interested uh, you should definitely visit our youtube channel and we can share that um, the webinar on our email uh, where you can watch the webinar details on that as well uh, could you i think there's a question for you yes so how do you expect real estate prices to be yeah. impacted in the coming months is it a good time to invest okay 
uh, yeah, again, I would expect it to soften a little, primarily because there are large layoffs. Uh, if you talk about it later on, the ability was already bigger. Median house pricing was 10x the median income, which means it was already a stretch for people. Uh, and so with all the large scale layoffs, people are going to put that uh, away, especially because it's a liquid asset and you would want cash to work things out. But the moment uh, the market is a little more current, I do expect prices to go back. Uh, one, because the interest rates are actually uh, going down and they're not going to go up anytime soon, which makes buying a real estate uh, asset easier. Uh, to a lot of people who, who won't be able to sell in the next few months, there are guidelines that you cannot actually have open houses, you cannot uh, show people houses and so on, which limits how much selling and re happen. So people intending to sell right now in spring and summer and who have to push it out for three, four months, suddenly uh, you will see supply as well. People who are trying to get out for personal reasons, leaving the city, changing jobs, things like that. So while it would soften in the short term, it's always a hurt. So it's not going to go down, it does on the same way, it's not a volatile. Um, in some months, we will really soften, but then eventually it will be macroeconomics. And so if you like Toronto or Atlanta or Seattle, the net number of people coming in is way more than the people leaving and houses are not have being constructed at the same pace, uh, you would see estate prices going back up. So in some time, in a few months, it might be a good time to buy real estate. I think there's another question on real estate. So, so there was one more question on real estate. Uh, yeah. Somebody is asking how is REIT different from real buying real estate? So I typed the answer. One is that REITs are mostly focused on commercial real estate. And two is uh, REIT, you don't need to invest a large amount like you have to, to buy a property. And I think that's where Kushbu's company also comes into yeah. play. So you can do what you are doing with REITs, but in this case, you can invest in uh, residential properties. So she's right. creating shares of residential properties rather than commercial properties. Is that right, Kushu? That is correct. And to add to that, I think um, one thing and which will Kushu, become- there's a question in the answer section. I yes, typed the fine. answer, but uh, so it doesn't show in the open questions. Oh. Okay, I, can you hear me? You okay. want to give your answer? Can you hear me? Are you on mute? No. You are on mute, Kushu, I think. I'm, I'm not on mute. Let me try one more. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me at all? Maybe you can type your answer. I cannot hear you. I don't know if others can. Oh, that's so strange. Oh, now we can. Okay. Um, well, I think um, what Chinmay uh, is saying is correct. I think just to add to that, uh, one of the biggest difference between uh, owning REIT shares and private residential real estate right now is that um, you can see the volatility difference. So REITs are pretty correlated to the stock market, especially the publicly traded ones. I own Vanguard REIT ETS and they're not doing well. Um, the correlation can be as high as 0.7 to 0.9, which is, it almost moves in tandem with the stock market. Private residential investments, on the other hand, are not as market, and the correlation coefficient is more like 0.2 to 0.3, which means if you're trying to diversify away from stock market, um, REITs is not a clear answer to that. Uh, you Private residential is better. Uh, the second big difference that happens being REITs and private is um, REITs are more like a diversified fund. So it's kind of, like you're not choosing where that investment goes, except for the fact that you know it's going into real estate. And it could include investments into things like construction companies, property management companies, and actual asset uh, properties. Uh, but versus private residential, which is um, very concentrated into residential real estate and is 
slightly lower risk um, and of course slightly lower return in proportion, um, but much safer bet. People will need houses. Uh, they need it probably more in coronavirus uh, with all the work from home. But the truth is it, that demand does not quite go away no matter what. Um, and so I think that way it is slightly different from REITs. Um, I think a company like ours, what it does is allows you to buy private residential real estate without having to shell out 100, 200 K uh, minimum deposit, uh, without having to take on additional mortgage and without having to deal with the whole hassle of anybody who has bought real estate knows dealing with the agents, the middlemen, the finding, the sourcing, um, it's, it's a nightmare. And so we take all of that away and make it uh, simple, like buying on Amazon, actually. I think there's more questions. Yeah, there's a question. Can you suggest some of the Canadian reads? Let me steer clear of that one. <laughs> that becomes a little politically incorrect an answer if I start um, promoting some of them versus the other. So I, I think I would abstain, but um, since I'm in this industry, it's not ideal if I promote some versus the other, given that we work some of them um, as in partnership also. So there'll be a conflict of interest. I, I leave it to the experts if they have any suggestions there. Yeah, I mostly invest in uh, uh, US markets, so I won't have much idea about Canadian rates as well. Same here. I'm not familiar with the Canadian markets. Sorry. But it shouldn't be hard to find them. Like, I think uh, if you just find a list of rates, uh, go with the bigger, the ones bigger in size, so there's less risk. Yeah, it is very important, however, when you're investing with REACH to understand the structure. So where exactly is the money going? What exactly are they doing? And what is the management expense rate? So they may say we have 0.5% fee, but there is about half percent of management expenses built into your return deduction that you don't realize you're paying as cost. And that either way. So things like things like that are important to know. Uh, how diversify in terms of the kind of property they are and then uh, take a call based on that because you would have um, residential REITs in Canada as well who do only residential but also have larger REITs like the Vanguard REITs that actually invest um, in a wide assortment of companies within the real estate space including companies. so you have to be careful of what you're getting because the risk profile one, what constitutes that? Okay, so that you know, the and the end of time. Um, I am glad other people could join for everybody. Um, we send around the link to the webinar and our webinar if you're interested. Um, and feel free to chat to us any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, there are more questions. Sorry. As a thumb rule, what percentage of my portfolio should be real estate? Does it vary by age? It does vary by age because it's a legal asset. And uh, yes, it usually varies between 5 percent to 4 percent, depending on where you are in terms of other parts of your portfolio and your age. But the large institutions like you can usually have 30 percent of portfolio in real estate. A given point in time, if that's an indicator of uh, how good fund managers invest. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye.